the SpaceX Dragon capsule has brought four astronauts back to Earth from the International Space Station. For over two decades, there was one country that could stop the International Space Station from falling out of the sky. One country. And it wasn't America. Every few weeks, a Russian spacecraft would fire its engines, push the station higher, and everyone at NASA would breathe a little easier. International Space Station. The four astronauts inside are beginning a two-week private research mission for Axiom Space. Then SpaceX showed up with a cargo ship, strapped some extra engines to it, and fired them for 19 straight minutes. Russia had never done that. What happened next forced space agencies around the world to rethink who really controls humanity's lifeline in space. The burn that changed everything. So here is the situation. The International Space Station weighs about 420,000 kilograms. That is roughly the weight of 300 cars just floating up there at 400 kilometers above your head. Picture 300 Honda Civics welded together into a structure the size of a football field, hurtling around the planet at 17,500 miles per hour. That is what we are working with. And every single day, it falls. Not dramatically, not like a rock, but slowly and steadily. The thin wisps of atmosphere that exist even at that altitude create drag. And that drag pulls the station down by about 100 meters every 24 hours. During solar maximum, when the sun is particularly active and the upper atmosphere expands, that decay can spike to 300 meters daily. The station just sinks. Now, 100 meters might not sound like much when you are talking about something 400 kilometers high. But here is the thing about orbital mechanics that people tend to forget. Orbits are not stable. They are controlled falling. You let that slide for a few months without doing anything about it, and suddenly you have got a million pound science lab re-entering the atmosphere over someone's house. So every few weeks, somebody has to fire up some engines and push the whole thing back up. This is not optional. This is existential. And for the past 25 years, that somebody has almost always been Russia. Their Progress spacecraft handled roughly 80% of all ISS orbital maintenance. 80%. Let that sink in for a moment. The Americans built most of the station, provided the power systems with those massive solar arrays spanning 73 meters, supplied the crews, ran most of the science experiments. But when it came to the fundamental task of not letting the thing fall down, they had to call Moscow. Progress is a capable vehicle, do not get me wrong. Its main engine produces about 2.95 kilonewtons of thrust, nearly four times what Dragon can manage. It has been flying since 1978 and has an excellent track record. But it is also expendable, meaning every single mission ends with the spacecraft burning up in the atmosphere. And it launches on Russian rockets from Russian soil, with Russian mission control calling the shots. Then on December 29, 2024, SpaceX's Dragon cargo capsule fired its thrusters for over 19 continuous minutes and pushed the entire station higher. The orbit went from about 257 miles to nearly 264 miles at its highest point. And here is what makes this genuinely interesting. Russia's Progress spacecraft has never performed a single burn that long. Their typical reboost lasts maybe three to five minutes. Dragon just did something that the spacecraft everyone depended on for two decades had never actually accomplished. Okay then, that was always allowed apparently. How do you teach a cargo ship new tricks? Time ago, a brand new SpaceX Dragon flying its debut mission docked to the International Space Station. Here is where it gets technically fascinating. Dragon was never designed to push the space station around. It was built to carry stuff. Food, experiments, spare parts, the occasional personal item for astronauts who have been stuck in a tin can for six months. The capsule's Draco thrusters were positioned to control Dragon's own movement during approach and docking. They point in various directions to let the spacecraft rotate, translate, and fine-tune its position. But pushing, a 420,000 kilogram station efficiently requires thrusters pointing in a very specific direction. You need them aligned with the station's velocity vector. Basically, you need them pointing backward, so when they fire, they push everything forward. So SpaceX did something clever. They built what they call a boost kit and stuck it in Dragon's trunk. The trunk is this unpressurized section below the capsule that normally carries external cargo and solar panels. 
it gets jettisoned before re-entry anyway, so if something goes wrong with the boost kit, it does not affect Dragon's ability to come home safely. Risk Quarantine. Very elegant thinking. The boost kit contains two Draco engines pointing directly backward, six propellant tanks holding hydrazine and nitrogen to troxide, and one helium tank for pressurization. The whole assembly is wrapped in thermal blankets to protect it from the brutal temperature swings of low Earth orbit, where you can go from 250 degrees Fahrenheit in sunlight to minus 250 in shadow within minutes. The hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide are what engineers call hypergolic propellants. That means they ignite spontaneously the moment they touch each other. No spark plugs, no ignition system, no hoping your lighter works in a vacuum. Just controlled chemistry. Very reliable, very predictable. And that is exactly what you want when you are pushing around something worth over $100 billion. And oh, would you look at that. The engines came from the Crew-8 mission. The propellant tanks came from SpaceX's 2020 abort test. They built a breakthrough orbital capability using recycled parts from previous flights. The same tanks that helped prove Dragon could save astronauts during a launch emergency are now pushing the entire space station higher. Which is very SpaceX when you think about it. Nothing goes to waste. Each Draco engine produces about 400 newtons of thrust. Together, the pair delivers roughly 800 newtons. Now that might not sound like much compared to the engines that launch rockets, but when you are in orbit, there is no air resistance to fight. You just need a gentle, sustained push. And Dragon can sustain that push for way longer than progress ever has. The uncomfortable truth nobody wanted to discuss. Let's explain why this matters so much right now. Russia announced they are leaving the ISS partnership in 2028. They have said this, unsaid it, reset it, and the situation keeps evolving. But the official position as of late 2024 is that they are out by 2028. They want to build their own station called ROSS in a different orbit, and they are done sharing with the Americans. Two and a half decades of partnership, and they are walking away. Now that creates a problem. A very big, very heavy, very falling out of the sky kind of problem. The ISS was designed as an international partnership where each country brings something essential to the table. This was intentional. It was supposed to create interdependence, make everyone invested in the success of the whole project, build trust between former Cold War adversaries. Noble goals, really. America provides the power. The massive solar arrays that span 73 meters across generate electricity for the whole station. Without American power systems, everything goes dark. Russia provides the propulsion. Their Zvezda service module contains the main engines for attitude control and orbital maintenance, and their progress vehicles do most of the reboost work. Without Russian propulsion, everything falls down. This was a cooperative arrangement that worked great when America and Russia were getting along. He announced yesterday that he's nixed an anticipated summit with the Russian leader, a meeting that Donald Trump himself was very enthusiastic about just last week after his... Nobody talked much about what would happen if that changed. But international relationships do change, and suddenly that single point of failure starts looking pretty concerning. What seemed like diplomatic genius in the 1990s looked like strategic vulnerability by the 2020s. And then it got worse. Much worse. On November 27th, 2024, something went badly wrong at Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. During a Soyuz launch carrying astronauts to the station, including NASA astronaut Chris Williams and two Russian cosmonauts, part of the launch facility collapsed. The service cabin at Site 31-6 fell directly into the flame trench, damaging Russia's only active launch pad for crewed ISS missions. Oh yeah, they're only one. So here you have the United States depending on Russia for the most critical function of keeping their space station in orbit, Russia planning to leave the partnership anyway, and now the Russian launch infrastructure literally falling apart during normal operations. That is what engineers call a suboptimal situation, what everyone else might call a crisis, the mathematics of not falling from the sky. Let's give you some numbers that explain why NASA is sleeping better these days. Dragon's boost kit can add about 9 meters per second to the station's velocity. That does not sound like much in everyday terms, but in orbital terms, it is significant. That single capability 
equals roughly one and a half progress reboost missions. During the CRS-33 mission, Dragon performed five successful reboosts over about five months, with a sixth planned before it undocks in January 2026. So one Dragon cargo mission can now handle somewhere between 25 and 33% of the station's annual orbital maintenance needs. NASA already flies multiple Dragon cargo missions per year under the Commercial Resupply Services contract. You do the math. Three or four Dragon missions could theoretically cover everything Russia currently provides. And NASA is not putting all their eggs in one basket either. Northrop Grumman's Cygnus spacecraft has also been qualified for reboost operations since 2022. So now you have two American commercial vehicles that can push the station higher. That single point of failure just became a multi-provider system. The cost comparison makes this even more interesting. Dragon and its Falcon 9 rocket are reusable. The CRS-33 Dragon capsule was flying for the third time. Progress and its Soyuz rocket are expendable. One launch, one use, then debris. When you are talking about routine operations that need to happen several times per year for the remaining life of the station, reusability adds up fast. Russia's monopoly on keeping the ISS in orbit just ended. And they did it to themselves by threatening to leave. The $843 million ending. Now here is where all of this connects to something even bigger. The ISS is scheduled to retire sometime around 2030 or 2031. And when it does, you cannot just leave it up there. At 420,000 kilograms, the station is far too massive to burn up completely during re-entry. If you just let it fall uncontrolled, pieces would scatter across thousands of kilometers, maybe over cities, maybe over your house. That is generally considered unacceptable. So NASA needs a deorbit vehicle, something that can attach to the station, fire its engines at precisely the right moments, and guide the whole thing into a controlled descent over the South Pacific. There is a spot out there called Point Nemo, the oceanic pole of inaccessibility. It is the point on Earth's surface farthest from any land, about 2,688 kilometers from the nearest beach. Over 260 spacecraft have already been dumped there, including Russia's Mir station in 2001. The ISS will be the biggest thing to ever make that final journey. NASA originally planned to use three Russian Progress spacecraft for the deorbit, but studies determined that would not provide enough thrust for the station's mass. So in June 2024, they awarded SpaceX an $843 million contract to build the US deorbit vehicle. And oh, would you look at that? The design is based on Dragon. The deorbit vehicle will be a modified cargo Dragon with a massively extended trunk section. Instead of Dragon's normal 16 Draco thrusters, this thing will have 46. 30 of them will be mounted in the extended trunk, pointing backward for maximum push. It will carry about 16,000 kilograms of propellant, roughly six times what a standard Dragon holds. The plan is to launch this vehicle about 18 months before the final re-entry. It docks to the station, hangs out while the last crews finish their work, and then waits. When the station drifts down to about 140 miles altitude, the burn sequence begins. Four days later, the whole thing enters the atmosphere and comes apart over Point Nemo. It will be the largest controlled deorbit in human history. The 170-day test program. Every single reboost that Dragon performs during CRS-33 is generating data for the deorbit vehicle. How do the Draco thrusters perform during extended burns in actual space conditions? How does propellant behave in the tanks during the weeks between firings? How accurate is the guidance when you are pushing a 420,000 kilogram structure through orbital adjustments? You cannot fully answer these questions in ground testing. You need real flight data, and that is exactly what SpaceX is collecting right now. The December 29th burn lasted over 19 minutes. That is a duration test for thruster reliability. The multiple burns across several months test how the engines perform after repeated thermal cycling and space exposure. The integration with station systems through the docking mechanism tests the command and control architecture that the deorbit vehicle will use. NASA is essentially paying for cargo delivery and immediate operational value, while simultaneously funding research and development for a future mission. 
SpaceX gets flight heritage and engineering data that directly shapes their $843 million deorbit vehicle design. The ISS gets altitude maintenance exactly when Russian delays create operational gaps. That is what smart contracting looks like. SpaceX director Jared Mehta said it directly. The data from these reboost demonstrations will be very helpful and will lead to future capability, mainly the US deorbit vehicle. Every engine firing is a data point. Every successful burn is a proof of concept. SpaceX is not stopping at Dragon. The company has Starship in development and the connections to what Dragon is proving right now are more direct than you might think. NASA now has options. If Russia delays progress missions, Dragon can cover. If Russia leaves the partnership entirely, Dragon and Cygnus can split the load. If something goes wrong with one system, there is redundancy in the other. Single point of failure eliminated. And all of this feeds directly into the capability needed to safely end the ISS program when that time comes. The deorbit vehicle is not some separate development track. It is a direct evolution of what Dragon is proving right now, just scaled up with more thrusters and more propellant. The ISS has maybe five or six years left of operational life. In that time, Dragon will keep pushing it higher every few months, maintaining the orbit that keeps the station from becoming the world's most expensive meteor. Starship will demonstrate orbital refueling, proving that spacecraft can dock and transfer propellant in the void. The deorbit vehicle will take shape in SpaceX's factory in Hawthorne, California, all 46 Draco thrusters of it. And when the time comes to bring the station down in 2031 to guide it to its final resting place at Point Nemo, where over 260 spacecraft have already been laid to rest, the capability will be ready. American engines, American control, American conclusion to an international project. What do you think? Was this a breakthrough moment or a quiet power shift? Share your thoughts below.